Let's start off by looking at uh, what we want to look at is the first couple of chapters of Galatians and then compare it to uh, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Testament of Asher, and a few things like that. I think this will be really interesting. Let me go over to, um, uh, we'll start with Galatians. And this is um, kind of a prototype I've been working on as far as the um, outlines and then the, uh, the text of Scripture. But basically, in here, we have the history part of Galatians, which is the first two chapters. And that's what we wanted to focus on. Uh, history, um, theology is the second two chapters, chapters 3 and 4. And then practical teachings in chapters 5 and 6. So, looking at this, uh, he talks about the... He gives an introduction to who he's talking to and who he's writing and why. And the fact that the gospel was being perverted. Uh, he defends his ministry and then talks about what happened at the Jerusalem Council, and what happened with uh, Peter. So let's look at that, just to start to kind of begin to go through this. So in Galatians chapter 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And this is King James, of course. Um, and to all the brethren which are with me, Unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you from, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's his introduction. Uh, he's writing uh, with a group of people, or he's with a group of people, writing to the churches of Galatia, the group. Uh, because of some problems going on. So the first section we want to look at here is verses 6 through 10. And it says, I marvel that you are so soon re removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not really another, but there some be that trouble you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. So, they were saved, they understood the gospel, everything was going fine. Somebody walks into their church and begins to change things, and they begin to follow it. It's not really another gospel, because there can't be another gospel, but it's a perversion of the gospel. And he says that though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And we've seen uh, in, like in Second Thessalonians, he talks about even if there's supposedly a letter for me saying something different, then you know that that's not true. So there's fake letters, things like that floating around. So Paul is saying, we presented the gospel to you. If anybody's going to change that in any way, shape, or form, it's a perversion. Even if it's got something with my name on it, you know that it's wrong. As we said before, I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. And that's a really strong language uh, for the Greek in this particular case. I do not now persuade men, or do I persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And so again, whatever the, the vast majority wants to do is one thing, and what the Bible says you're supposed to do uh, may be different. And whenever there is a difference like that, you want to follow Scripture. And of course, the Scripture he's talking about at this point would be the prophecies in the Old Testament. So let's look at this. This is where it gets a little bit interesting. So they, they're having a problem. He's writing to fix this perversion of the gospel which we will find out later is the party of the circumcision when we get to the practical aspect of it. But just looking at this part, he says, I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was pre preached of me is not after man. Neither I received it from man, nor was taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's not preaching the Pharisee doctrine or the Sadducee doctrine, or even in the sense the Essene doctrine, but what he got by special revelation of from Jesus Christ. And so you understand that he was a Pharisee, probably one of the brightest of the Pharisee group. He abandoned that to become a Christian. 
So you have heard, verse 13, of my conversation. Conversation is just an old English word for lifestyle, the way he lived his lifestyle. So the things that he did. You've heard about his lifestyle, his previous life, in time past, in the Jews' religion. Now that's an interesting phrase. Uh, when we get to the Gospels, there's always talk about um, a difference between the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, because it seems like sometimes the dates will be different or the information will be just slightly off. And one of the things that is really interesting is because when you're looking at dates or when did this thing happen or what order, things like that, we understand that Matthew tended to try to put all the parables together and all the events together and things like that. But um, the whole idea that uh, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke would be talking about the Passover or Hanukkah or uh, Tabernacles or Pentecost. And in John, sometimes it seems like the dates are different or they're out of order. And you'll notice that in the book of John, he always says the Jews' Passover, the Jews' Feast, or the Jews' Pentecost, or the Jews' whatever. And understanding that they're all Jews writing this, it seems kind of strange. And what we're looking at is whenever you see the Jews' religion, which actually would be being referred to as Pharisees or Sadducee. So Paul, we know, was a Pharisee taught under Gamaliel. And so in time past, he was the, excelled in the Jews' religion, or in other words, as a Pharisee. Now he's a Christian, which if you would plot those out to any of the denominations of Judaism, it would be more of an Essene nature or a Zadok priest nature. So, and this again says the same thing. So that helps a lot in trying to figure out the chronology. So when Matthew, Mark, and Luke say it was Passover, it was Passover as far as the Essene calendar is concerned. When um, John is saying it was the Jews' Passover, it would be the Passover as celebrated or when celebrated by the, fat, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So Paul uses the same language here. You have heard of my conversation in time past, my, what he did in his, in his life when he was in the Jews' religion or when he was a Pharisee how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion, Pharisee, above many of mine equals in my nation, being more ex exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And see, this is a kind of a, an important phrase here. The traditions of the fathers, uh, from the Pharisee standpoint, would be the oral Torah, which becomes the Talmud, which the Essenes are saying is not correct. The traditions of the fathers, so to speak, from the Essene point of view would be the testaments of the patriarchs, what the patriarchs actually wrote down, which would have to be legitimate if they are real. The Pharisees are saying, well, such a thing did exist, but what you have is fake. So each one of the denominations is pointing to the other saying you have fake traditions of the elders, or fake documents, because they don't go along with what we want to believe. So, but look at this then. So he's talking about his conversation in time past in the Pharisee way of life, the Jews' religion. He persecuted the church of God and was more zealous of the traditions of the fathers than anyone else. And Paul was very logical. If someone is a heretic, they need to be gotten rid of, okay? But the Roman, Romans were ruling Israel at the time, and you, the Jews themselves could not do capital punishment, and they had to get permission to arrest people, etc., um, on most circumstances. So Paul, being a Roman citizen, being a Pharisee of Pharisees, got permission from the Sanhedrin to go and hunt down Christians. Of course, when you find them, what can you do with them? He got permission from the Romans to be able to arrest, and or if they resist, kill. And so, very logical, you get the two powers together, and then you can go do whatever you wish. So he was more exceedingly zealous to persecute the church than anyone else. Most people would, would hate the Christians if they think they're heretics, but 
wouldn't go to the trouble of trying to get legal documents and go out and hunt them themselves and maybe get attacked back or whatever. But he wanted to please God, even if it meant sacrificing his life. He just misunderstood. He had his zeal without knowledge because he was a Pharisee. And then, of course, with the Damascus um, incident, he understood who Christ was. And we could say immediately changed, or we could simply say he understood and continued that zeal, but did it properly. So the traditions of the elders at this point would be the oral Torah. And then he says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, and that I might preach him among the heathen, I immediately conferred not with flesh and blood, neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. So let's stop here at this point for just a second. Um, we, we know he was a Pharisee, we know he was hunting Christians, and then we know from the book of Acts the incident he's talking about when he's on the road to Damascus, Syria, and he sees a vision and actually winds up being blind for a time because of it. So obviously it was a real experience. He sees this being, and this being says, why do you persecute me? And he realizes this is an angel or God or something. This is, you know, very important. It's not fiction. It's not something that a cult would do. It's not a demonic activity. So he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Christ whom you persecute. And at that point, he understands. And so uh, God sends uh, someone to pray for him, to heal him. And then, of course, he's let down from the basket. This is all in the book of Acts and escapes uh, because they decided to try to kill him at that point. Some people did. So this is the incident when he's talking about he's anti-Christian. He's got a zeal to put them in prison or kill them, whatever the case may be. He's on the road to Damascus to get this done, and he has a conversion experience. So he's saying that when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, and then that he might preach among the heathen, I immediately conferred not with flesh and blood. So he didn't go back to the apostles and start asking them questions or get them to agree or get them to teach him. He begins to understand this. Now, a few weeks back, we looked at the Testament of Benjamin from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we saw that it talked about how there would be a Benjamite who would understand, who would be in the synagogue of the Gentiles, uh, which we call the church, and they would have their own canon, which we call the New Testament, and that this Benjamite would write a series of, of scripts, books, epistles, that are in that canon and will be for all time. And this was ordained of God. So you can imagine understanding there's Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, picking the one that you think is correct, going full force with it, thinking that a cult has arisen, and so you're going to try to stamp it out because somebody's got to do something. And you realize this is the fulfillment of, of prophecy because you have this experience. So then you begin to go back and you look at the scriptures. You, could be, you go back and look at the others. You realize, well, a lot of the Pharisee stuff might be good, but there's some definite problems because apparently they didn't recognize Messiah. And Sadducees didn't believe in the Messiah either. But the Essenes are saying, we've told you so. We told you when he would come, how he would come. We, it's in the Testaments of the Patriarchs, etc. So naturally you would go back and look at those again. And in finding in there the prophecy about himself, which, think about that, that's amazing. You're reading the scriptures and you realize this scripture is talking about yourself. So Paul is not going to be conceited or say, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. You have to do what I tell you. He's looking at it in a very humble mode. I am the one that was prophesied to do this. I better do it correctly. And I would better, if, if I'm supposed to be your dad and train you, I need to train you the best way I can. And that means some discipline and some whatever, whatever it takes. So this is what's going on, <clears throat> but now look at what he does. He doesn't immediately go to Jerusalem, so what does he do? Neither I went up to Jerusalem to the apostles that were those that were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. 
Now, this is what's interesting because he, he's from he, the conversion experience. He leaves Damascus, Syria, and then goes to Arabia. Okay? Now, Arabia is um, basically the, the area of the Nabataeans. So Rome's main power extended all the way to and included Jerusalem or, or Israel. And so uh, it also says in the book of Acts that he was praying in the temple and he heard a voice saying, leave because they will seek to kill you. And so he gets up and leaves. Um, so all this stuff is going on. So he goes to Arabia. That's right outside of Roman jurisdiction or uh, to a point anyway. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's several nations on down past Jerusalem. Uh, that Rome is either in negotiations with, doesn't have complete authority or any authority there. So he goes there for a while to escape because the Jews are going to seek to, the same way that Paul was doing, and he understands this. The people that think he has uh, become a Christian, therefore apostatized from them, they could just as easily get uh, Roman documents for arrest and or execution on site. So he needs to leave before they would have him put to death. But now this is interesting. He returns to Damascus, or goes back to Damascus, is the way this says it. And one of the things that's really interesting is, um, it, it looks like you're in Damascus, Syria, you go to Arabia, you go back to Damascus for some reason. Another thing that might be going on that most people don't realize is, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's such a thing as the Damascus Covenant, or the Damascus Document. It's one actually there's a couple of damascus documents there's the community rule and other scrolls like that the thing that most people don't realize is that the and again it all goes down to names the zadok priests ran the the uh, qumran community and if you were a priest you could go there and do things if you're not a priest you can't just like you can't go into the temple uh, so you've got pharisees running the jerusalem temple and zadok priests in qumran but you could be a Pharisee in doctrine, following the Pharisees or following the Zadok priests. And so I could say I'm a Pharisee or a Sadducee following them, but not, not a ruling person from their class. I'm not a Zadok priest, but I could be an Essene. So that's how the language is used. So at this point, the Essenes that live in Qumran or Zadok priest, the people that follow the Zadok priest are Essenes that live throughout the land, much like other people. But one of the other things, they call themselves Yahad, uh, meaning one, one in the spirit actually is what that means. But they also referred to Qumran. Qumran is our name for that area. They referred to themselves as Yahad and to Qumran as Damascus. And so they were talking, it's a second Damascus basically. Not sure why, it's just one of the words that they used. So the Damascus Covenant, or the Damascus document, talking about the new covenant of grace, which was to begin with them, would begin in Damascus. And it doesn't mean Damascus, Syria. So with that in mind, let's look at this text again, just to see what we can see. So God revealed himself to him. That's when he was on the road to Damascus, Syria. Uh, and called him to preach the bre the, to the brethren. Now, he would not have known that automatically. He would have had to get his sight back, and then he would have had to have got out of Damascus, Syria, and went somewhere to find out about his calling and other things. Uh, so, neither did I go to Jerusalem, which would be dangerous for him to do, uh, or to them that were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia, okay, the area outside of the Roman area. Uh, and returned again, or went to Damascus. Now, if we're talking about not Damascus, Syria, but we're talking about um, Qumran, where the Essenes are, this, the other Damascus, it says, Then after three years I went up to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Now, in the Damascus covenant, if you want it in the community rule, if you want to become a Essene and you're qualified, it's a process that takes you three years. So this may or may not be directly related, but it looks like he's beginning to understand what's going on. He knows he's called of God. He goes through the process to leave the, the, the Judaism that he knows, which is the 
uh, fake tradition of the elders, the pharisaical branch, and study with the Essenes and understand those things. He reads about himself in the epistle of, of uh, uh, or in the testament of Benjamin and begins to understand these things. Then he goes back to the apostles. And you can think about this. Here's a guy that was killing all of your friends, mass murderer. From on human nature, I'd like to get rid of the guy. And he comes and he claims to be a Christian now. Yeah, right. Probably just doing that to arrest me. So very dangerous, very, very skeptical. And all of a sudden they agree, give him the right hands of fellowship. One of the things that I'm sure he does is you guys probably know about this. Here's the Testament of Benjamin. You know that someone takes the place of, of the disciple. You know that someone is of the tribe of Benjamin that begins to write scriptures and the calling. And so they agree that Paul is the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And remember in, in either first or second Peter, where Peter says, uh, our brother Paul, which writes things that are hard to understand, which the unstable rest to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. So Peter at that point is recognizing that what Paul is writing is actually scripture, a new testament, a new covenant. So many of these things kind of come together to paint a, a more complete picture. It doesn't really change anything, but it's really interesting what might be going on here. So after the three years, he goes up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But the other apostles I saw none except for the Lord, James, the Lord's brother. Now these things I write to you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came to the regions of Syria and uh, Sicilia. So we, we go to Arabia, then to Damascus, which might be Qumran, then to Jerusalem, and then up into Syria. So if we were talking about Damascus, Syria, you're talking about him going to Arabia, to Damascus, to Jerusalem, and then back up to the area where Damascus was. So it looks like he might be talking more of the Qumran area. Um, okay, and then he says, And he was unknown by, the, by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith that he once destroyed, and they glorified God in me. And I want to look at chapter 2 here for a second. Let me look at the chat room real quick and just see if there's any general questions. Okay, so here in Acts 2, Acts 2, in uh, Galatians chapter 2 is the, the Acts 15 council. In Acts 15, we have uh, brothers, it says brothers came teaching that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And by that, they mean conversion to Judaism. It's not just one thing, like you've got to be baptized by somebody. A baptism, if we were doing it the same way, would only mean you have a seminary degree, that kind of a thing. So if you convert to Judaism fully and are judged accordingly that you're doing it properly, then and only then could you be con converted and get circumcised. So these people are saying you've got to convert to Judaism first and then get circumcised and then get baptized. Then you can accept the Jewish Messiah and become a Messianic or a believer. And this is because of what Peter and the other guys call the party of the circumcision, which actually started during the times of the Maccabees. They misunderstood the concept that there are Jews and there are Gentiles. And even in Jewish circles with the Jews themselves, there are priests and there are kings and there's Sanhedrin. There are normal people. And not everybody gets to do the entire law of Moses. And so they started saying that uh, Gentiles need to observe some of this stuff and get circumcised, which is actually forbidden. You'd have to fully convert to Judaism or you couldn't be circumcised. That would be against the law, against the Torah. But they were beginning to garble everything in that 1st century and 2nd century B.C. And what was going on then is some of the other guys were saying, in addition to that, 
we're going to prove that we're holy by requir requiring the vast majority of Jews, just general Jews, to start doing some of the temple rituals. The uh, washings, the baptisms, the prayers, the, the, the rituals. And they begin to mix those things up. And this actually started a war between the Sadducees and the Pharisees in 80 BC, a civil war uh, that was never fixed. And they actually had to ask Rome to step in to um, reestablish order. And even Rome was not able to completely do it. They're, they kept having small factions rise up to attack each other. Each group thought that they were the only ones that understood scripture, and therefore they were mandated by God to go ahead and destroy the heretics. So everybody was trying to kill everybody. The Dead Sea Scrolls say at that point all of Israel was walking in madness. And this continues all the way up to 135 AD when Rome finally destroyed and banished the Jews. Uh, destroyed Israel and banished the Jews. So this is where this kind of stuff begins to creep into Christianity because they accept the Messiah. There are Jewish believers. There are Gentile believers. They start following the proper stuff. So the Gentiles are following Noahide law. Some of the Jews are following uh, Jewish law, Pharisaical law, Pharisaical traditions. It's, you know, all that kind of stuff is okay if it's your tradition, but you're not to be divisive on it and understand that other people don't follow it. You can't say that if the, the Gentile eats bacon, then he's going to go to hell. You, you can't say that. If you're Jewish and you're going to keep the Jewish traditions, you can't eat bacon, for instance, that kind of stuff. And then there's the Sabbath and all the other stuff. So they bring all of this together in the Acts 15 council. And the question was about food and all that kind of stuff. And the answer, if you just read Acts 15, is that the Gentiles need to accept Christ and obey moral law, basic moral law, but as far as the stuff we're talking about, uh, they need to stay away from idolatry, out of the idol temples. Don't eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol. Um, don't eat blood. Uh, and don't commit fornication. All those things are associated with idolatry. And if you do those things, you'll do well. And we get uh, in Acts chapter 21 where basically James is, is saying that again. The Gentiles do this and the Jews do that. We will remind them that that's the way that it works. So this is what's going on. So he says, 14 years later, after this incident, so he gets converted uh, in Damascus, Syria. He goes through this process of understanding the three years, understanding the scriptures, uh, the parchments and the papers in addition to the scriptures, understanding he's writing scriptures also, a new covenant. And then 14 years later, he goes back to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and he took Titus also. Now, Barnabas was a, was a Jew, like him, so circumcised, everything's fine. Titus was a Greek, a Gentile believer, so he was not circumcised. So, this is a brother that eats ham sandwiches and, and meat with cheese on it, and, and maybe, maybe observes a Sabbath, maybe he doesn't, but, you know, he's a believer, he's a waiting Messiah, he's a, you know, um, and he's a, a fellow believer, a brother with you. So they go back to Jerusalem. He says, I went up by revelation and <coughs> communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them who were of reputation, least by any means I should run or had run in vain. So he goes to Jerusalem to say, this is what's going on. Many thousands of Gentiles are coming to the Lord. This is what I'm preaching because it's the old way of doing it. We see it in Torah, we see it in the Dead Sea, you know, what the Qumran community, Dead, we call them Dead Sea Scrolls, and the other things. And so you, you, un you should understand. And they do. The, the leadership goes, no, that's actually correct doctrine. So we give you the right hand to fellowship. But he goes to the leaders who were uh, scholars in the scrolls, in the Torah, and, and in, the, in, in everything, so, and being led by the Holy Spirit because he didn't want to talk to someone who hasn't studied very well that would say, ooh, you're a heretic. That's not the way we've been doing it. So, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately of them that were of reputation, least by any means I should run or had run in vain, 
But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And because false brothers, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that he might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And so he's saying there, there is this concept, and this is what he's going to yell at Peter about here in just a little bit, this concept of if it doesn't really matter, let them do what they want, let the other guys do the opposite as long as we all get along. And that sounds logical, and that, that's true to an to a understanding as a certain part. But when you allow people to be militant, that, that's where the problem comes in. So if someone said, I'm of Jewish descent, I want to follow the, the, the pharisaical traditions and eat kosher and do this and do that, that should be fine. If you say, I'm a Gentile and I feel uncomfortable doing that because it makes me seem like I'm Jewish and that seems to go against what Paul said in Romans and Colossians and several other places, that's fine. But the problem is when someone says, no, we all need to be Gentile, you need to throw the kosher stuff away, everybody. Or we all need to be Jewish, you all need to start eating kosher. Or something along that line. And then you get this problem developing. And these false brothers came in. It, he seemed, seemed godly. He seemed to, to know the traditions. You'd have to because you'd want to show respect. But they actually follow him when he goes to the restroom to see if he's circumcised, basically. And he, they come back and report, this guy is not circumcised. Well, naturally, he's a Gentile. He's not supposed to get circumcised. Uh, but the tradition of the elders had it all backwards at that part, and it was creeping into the church. But Paul didn't give, sub give place to them for even an hour. He didn't say, well, let's talk about that. He basically came out and he said, that is sin. You, know, you should know better than that. You, you never, ever tell a Gentile that they have to get circumcised or that they have to go sacrifice an animal in a temple. You know, that's forbidden for them. You should know that. You can't do that kind of thing. And because that the people that don't know are going to get confused if you don't immediately correct something. That's why the Bible talks about uh, private sins you correct privately and public sins you correct publicly. It's talking about, for instance, uh, if, if I offended you, you should come to me and say, you, uh, you offended me. And I would apologize, okay? But if I'm preaching something at a pulpit and I say something heretical, you don't wait till later to come and say, I think that's wrong, we need to talk about it. Because someone else will be in the congregation listening to it. Nobody objects. They'll say, oh, I guess that's okay. And then next week when we fix the problem, they may not be there. So the main issue is not you offending me or me offending you, is that the teaching of the young people in Christ to make sure there's no stumbling block. So he immediately corrects this. Uh, but to those to seem, who seemed somewhat, whoever they were, they make no matter to me, God accepts no man's person, for they seem to be somewhat in confidence to me nothing. Now, in church history, uh, the church fathers will tell you the rest of the story of what's going on here. We're talking about Acts 15. And the main guy that started this problem was a guy named Charinthus, who, who later on becomes the archenemy of the Apostle John. But at this point, what had happened was he was a Sadducee. He seemed like he accepted Messiah, started believing that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, but continued this concept of the Pharisee-Sadducee tradition that everyone has to be following the law of Moses. And so this begins to, through his party, creep into the church. Now, later on, he's rejected from the church, and he's, he causes Peter a problem. When Peter, in Acts, goes to Cornelius' house and realizes that this guy is a centurion, he loves the Lord, but he is a Gentile, he does Gentile stuff, he's not Jewish, um, but he's all of a sudden baptized with the Holy Spirit, so obviously he's good enough the way he is for God. And that happens, and he goes in and preaches the gospel to him and his whole household, and everyone becomes a Christian. Well, in the next chapter, if you look at it, Peter gets yelled at by somebody because you're not supposed to enter a Gentile's house. 
Okay, and that's a perversion of the law because the law says you're not supposed to to enter a pagan temple. I totally agree with that. Uh, but they extended it by saying if this guy was a pagan, he might have had some sort of an idol or something in the back room, which makes his house a kind of a pagan temple. So you never set foot in a Gentile's house. That's bull. I mean, that's he may have an idol in the back, but that does not make it uh, an idol temple. And you, like Jesus said, the sick need the doctor. And anyway, if this guy was, it says there in Acts, he was known to be a God-fearer. He was a Gentile, but he loved the Jews, had given a lot of money to the synagogue to help with things. So obviously he's not an idolater. He's in the Roman army doing what Rome tells him to do, but that's not the same thing as of your own volition worshiping idols. So if this guy is a believer waiting on Messiah... It's stupid to not fellowship with him, much more than other people. So these guys are all backwards. But it was Cherinthius and his party that was actually causing that problem for Peter. Later on becomes the archenemy of John. And at this point, his party is causing the major problem in Acts 15. So later on, he is completely ousted by the Christian community. And there's another guy named Abian who creates the Gnostic Ebionites. Uh, based on Judaism, everyone, that same party of the circumcision idea, has to convert to Judaism first and then become one of the, the Gnostic group. And they actually come together and formulate stuff. Ebion and Cherinthus actually pulled together and formed what's called the Ebionite Gospel, uh, which is uh, a, one of the Gospels with a lot of stuff cut out, a lot of weird things put together. We only have fragments of it today. But again, it's just another starting of another cult. He didn't take correction. He had to divide over something that was stupid. And he had to go form his own denomination. And he wound up being a complete idiot, a complete cult, uh, non-Christian. So that kind of stuff is what's going on. That's who's doing it. So we understand he was from the Sadducee party, kind of sort of became a Christian, accepted the party of the circumcision concept, or brought it with him, and tried to divide over it, and eventually was ousted. So these false brethren are the ones checking these things out. So he says, and Paul says at this point, I'm not sure who all was there and who was actually doing it, but the church fathers record that later. But contrary wise, when they, the apostles, saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. I think this is interesting, and I think there's a lot of stuff in this one verse. Um, so Paul basically says, this is not right, get out, to stop causing problems. So they didn't yell at Paul for it. On the contrary, they said, and actually Paul's right. That's the old way of doing it. Gentiles are not supposed to convert to Judaism. They're supposed to be Gentiles. And Jews are supposed to be Jews, and priests are supposed to be priests, but the current Judaism still mixes all that stuff together. Um, and A lot of the Karahites of today and a lot of the scholars believe, for instance, when you go into a, um, uh, like even a Messianic synagogue, people will, will uh, wear the tzitzit, the, the prayer shawl, and the tradition is that you put a mezuzah on the doorpost of your house and all that stuff. I believe that is a mixture of mixing up of the doctrines. When you go into uh, today, for instance, if I'm driving down a just a residential street and I see a house, it looks like a normal house, but it's got this really big steeple on it. It's probably a church. If I buy a church and convert it into a house, I probably want to take that steeple off or people are going to be knocking at my door. Everybody just knows that a church is supposed to look this way, you know, and a house looks that way. And I think it's the same thing. Back in the day when you could be persecuted for being Jewish, uh, the easiest way to, rather than spending a lot of money doing something like that, <coughs> was to put a mezuzah at the doorpost. So if you know at the corner of Main and Second, there's a synagogue. You just go to Main and Second. You look at all the houses around, you find one that's got a mezuzah, that's the synagogue. If there's a guy there that has a prayer shawl, 
He's the rabbi, the pastor, the priest, etc. And so a lot of those things get garbled with the, with the yarmulkes and all that stuff. And they have other traditions. And this is kind of what's going on. People are mixing all these things together. They have a meaning. We need to know about them. We need to study them, but not necessarily practice them, uh, depending on who you are. Um, let's see here. So God was working through Peter Mighty, apparently, with Jews, and through Paul to the Gentiles. But it also says something here I, I want us to look at. This is pretty interesting. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed to me, they didn't commit it. They recognized that God had already done it. In the same way that Peter had the apostleship to the circumcision. Now we know there is a prophecy about a Benjamite being the um, apostle to the Gentiles. So I'm wondering if there's not also a prophecy somewhere about um, a person from Peter's tribe, or Peter, being to the circumcision. If there is such a thing, it might be the basis of what gets confused later on to say that Peter is the first pope. I mean, it makes sense that if you're going to make up something like that, it would be based on something rather than just totally made up. So it's, it would be something interesting to look through now that we know something that we might be looking for through the church fathers' writings or other things to see if there is anything like that. Again, whether it exists or not or did or not, it's really irrelevant. It doesn't change anything, but it might help us understand this a little bit better. So it says, then James, Cephas, which is probably Peter, there was another Cephas, but that's probably Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that grace was given to me, gave to me and to Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision only that we should remember the poor, which is what we were eager to do. Now, this last part here I just wanted to mention, and then we'll look at Asher, because it's got some interesting things in it. Uh, Peter opposes Paul, and it says, when Peter, came, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So this is a, a, a uh, logic fallacy, something that we might fall into, and it's really easy to fall into if you're not thinking straight. Uh, but the Testament of Asher would explain this really well. Um, for he was to be plain. Okay, so here's the situation. Before certain people came from James, and of course we know who they were, they were Cherinthius and Ebion and, and those guys before they had apostatized. They were with James' group there in Jerusalem, uh, where the Sanhedrin was and all that stuff. So before their representatives, at least, uh, came, he used to eat with the Gentiles. Okay, and so that was supposedly forbidden. Um, Gentile food is forbidden. Eating with Gentiles that are eating Gentile food is forbidden. All that stuff. And Peter began to understand that it, yeah, we're one in Christ. There's no more Jew nor Gentile. We're one in Christ. There's no more Hebrew roots or Noahide. We're one in Christ. And so uh, those things were for the priests, and they meant something, and it's important that we study it and find out why the forbidden food is forbidden and the clean food is clean and what the symbolism is, what does it mean. need to find that out, but it definitely does not apply. So he was eating and drinking with Gentiles, other brothers in Christ. But when these guys came, he separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. Okay, so he either is fearing in a, le in a light way that they would cause a problem, or maybe fearing that they, with the Sanhedrin, the government type stuff, might actually persecute uh, with letters of arrest, like Paul did. So we don't know how far it was going, but the whole concept of he separates himself and starts following the, the tradition of the elders the way they want it done to avoid problems. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, I said in the truth of the gospel, I said before Peter to them all, 
If you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now, he may not have been saying that the Jews or the Gentiles have to eat kosher and have to say the right prayers, and but to separate from them is saying there's a difference between you and me. You're a Gentile, a dirty Gentile, and I'm a pious Jew. You're a sinner and I'm not. And that's the concept, and so that has to be broken. Even Jesus ate and, and drank with publicans and sinners. He didn't sin, but they need to become Christian. And if they were a tax collector or some sort of sinner, and now they're a believer, they're a believer. We don't need to be segregating things like that. Uh, today, you will still occasionally run into a church uh, that says blacks are not welcome here. And I know that sounds strange. I haven't been in one of those in, in like forever. But when I was a kid, I actually went to a, this little Baptist church and it seemed to be really nice. And my sister brought a friend of hers uh, from work. She had just started working and a little a black girl that she worked with. And everything seemed to be fine. And later on, uh, one of the elders talked to my sister and my sister was telling us later, it's like the elder basically said, they have their own churches to go to. Don't bring those people around here. This is a white church. And I was surprised. I mean, that's when probably around 1980-ish or so, somewhere in that neighborhood, that there would still be things like that. And you might think that maybe there's something like that way, way down south, you know, with the traditions and stuff. But I live in the Kansas City area, so maybe there isn't anything like that anymore, but hopefully not. If she's a, a believer, she's a sister in the Lord. But this is the kind of stuff going on, not not a race thing per se, but a religious thing, this, the circumcision and all that. So he says, um, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Christ. You know this from the prophet Habakkuk in the Old Testament. The just live by faith. Uh, you're supposed to try to do the law in the proper way that you're supposed to do it. If you're not a priest, there's 400 of those 618 laws that you do not touch. You don't try to do the entire law. It's forbidden. So you need to do the things that you're supposed to do. And even at that, though, you realize you can't do it perfectly. So we all need a sinner. And that's what the law came to do, is to show us that we need Christ. So he goes and he says, um, We know we're not justified by works of the law, but faith by Christ. Uh, even if we, even we have believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by faith, not of works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners. Is Christ therefore the minister of sin? And that is, God forbid. What he's saying here is, what if there was some truth to this, you don't eat with a Gentile, even if he is a believer, unless he's a full convert. Okay, that's a pharisaical assumption. But let's say it actually was in the law, in the Torah, that specifically said that. Well, we're a new man in Christ. There's no more Jew or Gentile, so we don't follow that. Well, does that mean Christ is telling us to break Torah and to sin? No, God forbid. <laughs> we follow Christ. We're dead to the law. We're dead to Moses. We're dead to sin. We follow Christ. And that's the only key. So should we get circumcised? No, it's we're, that, that's forbidden. So should we do it just to appease the masses and the weird people? No. Because it's not about you and about me. All these other people that think they have to do all this stuff in order to become a Christian are not going to become a Christian because of them and because of you and me because we're not standing up for the truth. Okay. Um, it says, For if I build again the things that I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I'm crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. So I will not or I do not frustrate the grace of God, because if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. So the point of this, though, is that even Barnabas kind of got carried away with this. It sounds kind of logical. We say we're in a denomination, and we know that somebody's making a change way up there somewhere, and it's not a biblical one. And we're going to continue to follow the scriptures. One of their representatives is going to be here for one week. We can either put things back and appease them for one week, and then they go away, and then we can put things back the way we want them and continue to do the truth. Rather than have them excommunicate the church, pull the church building away from us, uh, reprimand us, kick us out of the denomination, all the things that they could do. So that seems kind of logical because then we wouldn't have a place to teach the, the kids and it sounds logical. But what Peter, what Paul is saying is forget about them. God's in control. If God allows you the church to close, it closes. If he wants it open, believe me, it'll stay open. There's nothing that you can't shut something that God wants open. So you just follow directions. Just follow what the scripture says. Don't worry about those guys. And if they're wrong, you need to say something because one of the little ones might be offended. We don't want to cause a stumbling block for anybody. I can argue with one of the big guys and I doubt he's going to get upset and lose his salvation or something. It's the little guy that's just now beginning to think about becoming a Christian that we need to be con concerned about not somebody that wants to argue. And so that's the whole concept. With that, let me flip over to, this is the Testament of Asher, and it's one of the Testaments in the uh, Testaments of the Patriarchs. There's 40-some uh, Testaments that are supposed to have existed. We have fragments of a uh, vast majority of them. And this is Asher, one of the kids of uh, Jacob. And it's specifically on... Um, thinking right. Uh, the title uh, that was given to it is hypocrisy and vice and virtue. And this whole concept, it fits in really well because it seems like it would be a godly thing to just smooth things over until the big guy goes and we can get back to normal stuff. But the point is what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. We shouldn't be arguing, but there can be a debate and we should stand up for the truth. Okay. So this is interesting here. Uh, let me just pull this up here a little bit. Um, he talks about, there's, there's basically eight sections. His introduction and death are two of them. Prophecies about the Messiah uh, is this last part here. But the middle part here, it talks about evil that appears to be godly. And that's one of those things like that. It appears to be godly. Why cause a problem when you don't have to? But it's not. It's actually hypocrisy. And that's what Paul was saying. And then it talks about godliness that appears to be evil and the concept of being single-minded, focusing on the Lord. So let's look at this. This is pretty interesting. Uh, here's an example of people that think wrong, the hypocrites, or not the hypocrites, but the evil, the liberals, the people that don't understand God's justice. So, for instance, it says, uh, there are those who speak good for evil's sake, and it only brings trouble. Now, that's easy to understand. There's politicians that, that tell you whatever you want to hear, and it sounds great, uh, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons, just to get elected, just to get money, whatever, and it always causes trouble. Uh, but the other is, is possible, too. So he gives some examples here. There's a man who shows no compassion on a truly repentant sinner. And this looks like righteousness, but it's actually sin. And I think we would, we would all wholeheartedly agree on that. I don't care what kind of sin you did. If you're truly repentant and you're going to be a follower of Christ now, your past is irrelevant. You're a brother in the Lord or a sister in the Lord. Now, if you're lying to me, that's different. So you need to be tested. But if you're truly repentant, no. So these people that say, well, you've, you've sinned a sin that cannot be forgiven. Well, there's only one sin that can't be forgiven. That's rejecting Christ as your Savior. So the second idea here is a man who chooses to live with or even die for an evil person 
because he loves him. This has an appearance of righteousness, but it's actually sin. Sometimes you'll have a parent that has a child that maybe steals a car or something, and the parent, because he loves the child, will try to somehow get rid of the evidence or you know help the person out. That's sin. I mean, you, you don't want your child to go to prison or to face charges, but they need to, you know, that kind of a thing. There's a better way of doing it. Bring them, bring them up, let it all go to court, and then try to have get the court's mercy. That's the proper way of doing it. There is com- there is a type of compassion number three that conceals evil in the name of mercy. It may seem good, but it only brings more evil. That kind of compassion turns mercy into sin. I just thought that was uh, really an amazing concept. Mercy is to be given if someone is repentant. Mercy is not to be forgiven because they're a family member or something else. If you're fairly sure that they're going to commit the sin again, something needs to be done to stop it. Scripture says, love or do justice. And then secondarily to that, love mercy and walk in humility. Uh, And so that's the whole concept. Um, Let's see here. One person steals, cons, plunders, or even defrauds, but they pity the poor. He seems to be both good and evil, but in reality he is only evil. When he defrauds his neighbor, he provokes God and swears falsely against the Most High. Even though he pities and maybe even refreshes the poor, he sets aside the law of God, defiling his soul. He may appear to be good, but in reality, he kills many and pities few. And so it's, it's interesting to look at that kind of stuff because I see a lot of things like that. Can I say progressives in the government that want to like super tax everybody so they can help the poor? It sounds good, but there, it really doesn't work out that way. Another person commits adultery and fornication, for instance, but abstains from eating meat. That's the, maybe they're Jewish and they're doing the kosher thing. Uh, this fasting only works evil. He perverts many through his wealth and power. The fornication turns his fasting to sin. So we could say this a different way. A guy that commits adultery and fornication and maybe steals, but he tithes a lot at church. What difference does it make? It's blood money, so to speak. So that's what they're talking about. Such men are like swines and hares. They're half clean. They look half clean, you know, but in reality, they're just unclean. And the three and four is what I wanted to look to, and then we'll stop for tonight. Uh, The hypocrite defined in, in three, it says, my children do not be like the hypocrite practicing both good and wickedness. Instead, Hold fast to what is good, for God rests in goodness, and all men desire it. Flee wickedness. Destroy the devil by your good works. The hypocrites do not serve God, but their own lusts, their own desires, pleasing Belial or Satan and other men like themselves. So, and then here's some more of the same kind of stuff. The godliness that appears to be evil from a liberal's standpoint. Hypocrites consider godly people that are single-minded to be an error. Well, we consider people that are double-minded to be an error. So here's an example. <clears throat> they say that putting a murderer to death is, a, is evil, shouldn't kill anybody. But in reality, it's a good work because it uproots and destroys evil from the land. You can't allow murderers to run free. And of course, we're going to say, well, we're going to take them then and put them in prison and keep them there. If that would work, that would be okay. That would keep them from killing other people. But it doesn't always work. Death is a permanent thing. It, it always works in that case. So we, we're supposed to be having capital punishment. Uh, the second point is they, the hypocrites do not understand that it is not hypocritical to show mercy on a truly repentant adulterer or thief, 
but to punish the unrepentant sinner. For both acts are both are acts of righteousness because he follows the Lord's example, in that he refuses evil that appears to be good, which is actually evil. So that whole concept, if if I see that you're really repentant, I should for, if I was a judge, I should forgive you. And the other guy that's not repentant should not be forgiven. But what the the hypocrites or the liberals are going to say is you're playing favorites. You like this guy because he's of the same religion you are and you're cutting him some slack. That's hypocritical, that's evil, that's unrighteous. Actually, no, that is righteous because there is only one God. And if this person is re truly repented, he's repented. And if this person makes it obvious he's not repented, he needs to be removed from society until he repents. The third part here um, says, they also think it's hypocritical to strive against those who carouse, but the righteous know that by tolerating sinners, that's that magic word today, we have to tolerate everybody. Well, everyone has to tolerate the Christians too. But by tolerating sinners, they will pollute their souls and defile their own speech. How many times if you, maybe you don't curse at all, but you hang out with people that do, maybe you have to at work or something. You know, I think we've all been through that where for whatever reason, we're hanging out with people that do things that we don't like. The next thing we notice, we're kind of picking up those habits. And that's what he's talking about here. So it is a righteous act to, be, to both refrain from these actions and forcibly stop others from doing them. And that's the way it used to be. People, I, I still get occasionally people say, you know, it's like, well, you need to harden up and just get, that's the world and we're in the world and you just need to get used to it. Like, not really. If, flip that around again. How many people go to work, or I mean, go in for a job interview and say, you know, I'll do what I blank any blank please, and you're just going to have, no, you're, you're going to get fired. How many people, when you seem to be giving a really good interview and you're, the, the boss is really thinking of hiring you, but just to double check, he checks your Facebook status, he finds you on Facebook, and sees the kind of things that you do and how you've been in trouble and how you talk and things like that and decides that, yeah, I don't need him as a representative of my firm. That's not going to look good. And so same kind of stuff happens. And that used to be the same in, and it's still somewhat like that in almost everywhere that's, that's serious, not even religious, but it, it, in the workplace, there are rules you follow. Such men are like stags and hinds. They're wild in nature and seem to be unclean. It doesn't seem to be logical from what the hypocrites would say. But they're actually altogether clean. They walk in a zeal for the Lord. They abstain from what the Lord hates and forbid, forbids by his commandments. And they ward off evil for good. So just looking at a few of these things, I thought it was really interesting to look at that and go back at what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2. The problem is, you might think that it's logical to go ahead and just not cause a debate. These guys think one thing, these guys think another. Let's just kind of keep them apart only for a week and then they'll be gone. So, you know, to not cause a problem. Well, the problem exists and the problem needs fixed, not ignored. And that's what Paul has said. It's actually hypocrisy to, to not try to talk those things out. In reality, if Peter would have come out and said, this is the way it is, it wouldn't have helped the matter at all. I mean, Peter was right in the, in the sense that the way Trinthius and Ebion were, it would have inflamed them. There would have been a, a bad situation happen probably. But it needed to happen. I mean, it eventually happened in Acts 15. And then they were eventually forcibly removed from the church altogether, and they become heretical, and then actually form their own cults. So it may seem logical, and you really don't want to go through that kind of stuff, but sometimes you have to. So just wanted to kind of compare those two. Um, so we have some really interesting points in Galatians. Um, 
Paul talking about some of the major points that we've we saw today is the idea that when he talks about the Jews' religion, he's not talking about Jews altogether, but specifically Pharisee, Pharisee Sadducee group that he was with. Okay, so he was a Pharisee, so that's the Jews' religion. And if you see the Jews Passover, it's the way the Pharisees are doing the the lunar calendar, as opposed to the way that the the Christians and the um, the Essenes would have been doing the solar calendar, so the actual Passover, you know, etc. And then that whole concept of it seems godly to avoid a problem, but sometimes it's actually hypocritical and sinful. So you have to always be looking at um, the new believer or the possible convert. So if you and I get into a heated argument, it's not, I mean, I'll think about it and maybe repent, and hopefully you'll think about it and maybe repent, but none of us are going to go to hell because of it, right? But if we have this, this problem and it offends a, 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 someone that hasn't converted yet and they end up not converting and it's because of me, that's bad. I mean, that's really, really bad. That's the one thing that we want to avoid is offending a little one. So... Lots of things. Oh, and then also the point about uh, since the Essenes used the term Damascus for the new covenant of grace and called Qumran Damascus, Paul may have been referring to going from Damascus, Syria to Arabia, then to Qumran to study, where he finds out that he is the apostle to the Gentiles in the epistle of, or the uh, Testament of Benjamin taking that to Jerusalem, showing the prophecies to James and to Peter, and immediately being told, yep, that's right, and getting the right hands of fellowship. And then it proves itself later. I mean, anybody could come up and say, I happen to be a Benjamite, I'm the guy. Well, there's going to be a guy, we know that from the prophecy, but let's wait a little while and see what you actually do. Go out there, we're not going to give you any money, <laughs> Go out there and see what happens. So 14 years, he comes back and says, this is what happened. All these people are saved. This happened, this happened, this happened. At that point, it's like, he's got to be the guy that fits the prophecy. I mean, that's, so we'll give him the right hands of fellowship. So very, very interesting. 